Chapter Thirty of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty: More Mountains, Ordeal by Mule, The Alpini, Another Night in Another Hotel, and then came the visit to the Alpini. In the morning we went round to see some potentate or other who lurked in the town hall, which had been taken over by the military authorities. He gave us some permission to do something which I did not catch, and off we started. It was necessary to do about twenty miles in the car before we got near these mountain trenches, and then came the most terrible feat of all. We had been driving along the usual mountain spiral roads, rushing through forests over cascades on thin, flimsy-looking bridges, past vast waterfalls, half of which were usually frozen and covered with snow. At length we came to a halt. I wasn't surprised, as the road had ended and a colossal mountain stuck up on either side. "'Are we there?' I asked. "'Not quite,' replied someone, and with that I became aware of a group of mules being led towards us. I hoped they would pass, but no. "'What do we do now?' I asked again. The Duke interpreted the cataract of conversation he had been listening to. "'We now have to do about an hour and a half's ride on these mules,' he said." He seemed to relish this idea. Dukes are prone to writing, I have noticed. I am not. I would have given a large sum of money to have seen a glacier or something slide down the hill and obliterate those mules. We all got out of the car, and the Duke and I, plus a few assorted officers who were to act as guides, made for the mules. I clambered up the side of my mount and was relieved to notice that an Alpini soldier was going to lead the beast with a rope. The Duke and the others rode these mules as if they liked nothing better. I sat like a pair of compasses on mine. We started off. First of all over a perilous wooden bridge, and then off up a precarious slope at an angle of forty-five degrees. Oh, that ride! For one hour and a half I was busily engaged trying to avoid sliding off over the mule's tail. That road was a disgrace if you could call it a road. It was a narrow, twisting track, winding through a pine forest at an almost impossible angle. Many times on that journey I felt it was a toss-up as to whether my mule and I would go sliding all the way back to the bottom of the hill. The path was made of large, rough stones with occasional wood struts across it, and apparently the object of the designers had been to take one round the most frightful hair-raising corners and nerve-shattering ravines. I confess that when crossing a mighty chasm full of raging mountain torrent on a three-foot bridge I was in a funk. These mules were amazing. They seemed to think nothing of crossing one of these elementary bridges with a half-melted glacier underneath on three legs with the other over the side. They ought to ride monkeys, not mules, in these places. An hour and a half of this, I thought as I rode along. My alpini guide was ahead, assisting the mule and me by means of a long rope fixed somewhere near the mule's nose. I couldn't see where. I wished he wouldn't do this, as it forced a pace on me which was very uncomfortable, especially about the seat of the trousers. I didn't like to speak about it, though, as I hate hurting people's feelings, even in alpinis. It seemed to last for hours, that trip. A never-ending forest and a path that seemed to have been designed to include everything in the way of excitement. At last, when my stamina and nerve were at the lowest ebb, I became aware of the fact that there was humanity about. This phenomenon manifested itself by means of sundry swarthy faces which peeped at one from behind trees. The woods became alive with curious dark brown eyes glaring out of the undergrowth. These faces belonged to the Alpini whose forest home we had now reached. The sight of an English officer awakened them a bit. The first they had ever seen, and a poor specimen at that. I must have looked like a sort of mascot officer on a toy mule, of the sort you might see at Gamages. I did my best to throw an expression of, I love hunting and am a devil for riding, into my face, but I fear I failed. These mountaineers saw through it. At last our cavalcade came to a welcome halt. The Duke, who had enjoyed the ride, I think, dismounted, and I removed my stiffened, battered body to the ground. The mules were dragged off to some cavern, but were unfortunately fostered for our return. We now had to do the rest of the journey on foot. We scaled a precipice and at last reached what we were looking for, the forest mountain home of the Alpini. 
We saw the colonel of this regiment, and he showed us all around. I still felt I was riding the mule. The duke, on the other hand, was walking about as if nothing had happened. I looked with pain at the various means of defense and offense employed by these wonderful mountaineers. Oh, that mule! I was shown ridiculous trenches which ran up to the side of an almost perpendicular mountain of solid rock. In some cases I observed that the Austrians and Italians shared a mountain. Appalling discomfort and no result. The only offensive that occurred in these volcanic regions was occasionally when an Italian would unexpectedly meet an Austrian round a boulder, and would at once engage in mortal combat, ending probably by having a dagger, or possibly a bayonet, stuck in each, and both rolling down six thousand yards of mountains, there to be marked hereafter by two neat but small wooden crosses. Such is national antagonism. After an exhausting few hours looking at these wonders, we were piloted back to lunch. These Alpini saw other human beings about once a year, so when I was dragged into lunch they were determined to make the best of it. Being a British officer, too, the interest was intense. The ancient mariner, stopping at one of three, was nothing to this. They held me in conversation for an incredible period. I thought that lunch would never end. From about half-past twelve to four o'clock it lasted, and during that time I had to describe what was going on on other fronts, and war news generally. Poor devils! They were stuck away up in these impossible mountains without any chance of coming into the world. I suppose some day years hence they will come back into the world and find that the war's over. They will never hear about it otherwise. I spent many days after this going to see various forms of mountain fighting, and I wandered through many miles of alpine scenery, spent hours in many a still mountain forest glade, and pondered on this distant, obscure warfare which was being relentlessly pursued. I saw all the celebrated mountains which had been captured, and had many a meal with various mountain detachments. Night and silence, midst those vast mountains, was a wondrous thing, very depressing to me somehow. The futility of it all seemed to hit me hard. I remember near Monte Piave, coming to some small, isolated wooden crosses marking a few graves on the icy shadows of the mighty mountain, and I couldn't help evolving a small verse as I looked at the scene, and have since made a large painting of the theme. Here amidst the frozen dolomites, a battered cross, some mountain flowers, a breeze, a hero of a hundred alpine fights, one hears his story from the whispering trees. I left the mountains one fine morning and returned to Udine. My time was up now on the Italian front. I had seen many things and had absorbed the many wonderful details in connection with the peculiar war which it was necessary for Italy to cope with. The main feature which struck me most forcibly was their great engineering ability, their rapid rebuilding on devastated areas, their great wire-rope transport schemes in the mountains, etc. I left the Italian front taking my hat off deep and low to their ability. Before leaving Italy I asked permission to visit Rome en route. I was very keen to do this. As I was so near I was most anxious to have a day amidst the historic wonders of Rome. I was readily given leave, so off I started and left Treviso in a Pullman car seat for the ancient city on the Tiber. After Rome I was to return to England to turn the mass of impressions and detail I had obtained into a set of pictures of life on the Italian front. I determined to work a bit in Rome, and then return via Paris to London to complete the job. I arrived in Rome. End of chapter 30 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter thirty one of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one Rome, Return to London, The Better Ole, A Request from America. What a charming spot Rome is. Here one was clean out of the war. Hotels, cafes, theatres, bright sunny days with people all amusing themselves. I had only two days in Rome, but I got busy at that time. I bribed a motor merchant to take me everywhere worth seeing. I took his car for a morning and went off to the Appian Way. Saw the baths of Caracalla in the Colosseum. I should have liked a week in Rome to let all these wonders soak in. A good look round St. Peter's and the Vatican completed my sightseeing. 
I stayed at the Grand Hotel near the station and found it to be the usual sort of pomp, glitter, and marble business, which apparently is inseparable from grandeur in all countries. At this date, besides my pictures, which had been appearing regularly every week, I had completed another effort with which most people are now familiar, namely the play The Better Ole. It had been finished just prior to my departure for Italy, and the theatre management had been getting on with the production. I picked up papers in Rome which announced its forthcoming appearance in London. Being particularly anxious to be back in time to look over the final rehearsals and details, I was not sorry that the Italian tour had ended at such an opportune moment. I was not going to stay long in Rome, but hurry along back, so that whilst getting on with my finished sketches I could also now and again go to superintend rehearsals at the theatre. After the usual journey, Rome, Paris, London, I settled down to work hard on all the subject matter I had called in Italy. Each day and all day I have worked for months on end at the real hard labor which drawing cartoons entails. I started on my Italian drawings and found time in the evenings to go to rehearsals of that show, The Better Ole. Now that it is an accomplished fact, I want you to exonerate me from any idea of ego or advertisement whilst I tell you the result of this show. It played in London for over a year, twice daily. Five touring companies toured and are touring as I write and have played in the same towns over and over again. It is an equal success in America, Canada, and Australia, whilst among its minor activities it has toured India. Yet on the night before the first production I would willingly have accepted a small fee to have the whole show cancelled. I felt that I could place little or no reliance on others sufficiently understanding to interpret the real meaning of Old Bill, Bert, and Alf, for they are the embodiment of my idea of a great and curious phenomenon the psychological temperament of the British race. Added to which there was the peculiar atmosphere and romance which this unique war has possessed. However, the play started and has had the results above mentioned much to the surprise of the management and sundry other individuals whose ideas, of necessity, largely rotate round girls, tights, and rag music. The better ole having been fairly launched on its run, I worked all day and every day on my drawings for the war office, which subsequently went to papers all over the world. Now came another big and interesting move for me. I was suddenly informed that the American Propaganda Department had applied to know whether it was possible for me to go to visit and live with the American Army in the field, there to find and create similar characters to Bill, Bert, and Alf. So said the cable. This was great news. I had been with the British, French, and Italian armies, and now was to go to the last joined army of all, the American. America was just beginning to send her first troops to France, and I was to be with them on their initial appearance. I received my orders and instructions, and forthwith set off to join the ever-rising tide of the American army, and to see life way out in Alsace-Lorraine. I little thought that this was to be my last front in the war. But after the long session I spent out round this area, I left it to hear of the armistice before my return again to France. I left for the American front full of enthusiasm, vigor, and curiosity. End of chapter 31. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 32 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32. Start for American Front. Common Sense Methods. Neufchateau. A Cordial Welcome. I think perhaps I was keener on going to this front than any. The arrival in Europe of a vast army of our own kith and kin from over three thousand miles away was a great and wonderful event. And what was no small consideration in my case, I was going among soldiers who spoke my own mother tongue. Moreover, the American army was taking over the most romantic part of the whole French battle line, Alsace-Lorraine. All ways to the front run through Paris, at least all fronts except the British, and consequently I found myself once more in the French capital, thus making the eleventh time I had crossed the channel. Back at the old Gare du Nord, and a lonely night or two in Paris, I reported at the headquarters of the American Intelligence Department in the Rue Saint-Anne off the Avenue de l'Opera, and there received intelligent consideration and answers which somehow one expects but does not always find in an intelligence department. 
The American staff officers were most courteous, and without any loss of time explained how I was to get to my destination. Going to the American front was made the easiest thing in the world if you were authorized to go, and your mission was genuine. The American methods are direct and to the point. Common sense is turned on rapidly and clearly, and a decision one way or the other arrived at without a month or two of past for necessary action. I left Paris for the railhead most suitable for my ultimate destination, which was Gondricourt, and made very much the same journey that I had taken before when going to Verdun. We passed through bar le duc and trickled along a desolate line of rails until we reached the dull-looking war-worn town known as Gondricourt. This was an American railhead, and this was my first sight of the American army. There were a few of these children of the West hanging about the station and I could feel at once the type of soldier they were. My first big impression of America in our European war, and an impression I still retain, is that they seemed to jump in at the point which it had taken us four years to get to. Within a week of landing they looked as if they had been in the war since 1914. They wallowed off into the mud, misery, and destruction without any amateurish looking deportment. The men at the station were probably waiting around for the arrival of military stores or something of that sort, whilst of course the collection comprised one or two military police, which you find anywhere. All fine, healthy-looking men, a hint of what I was to see later. A car was waiting for me at the station, and in I got with my baggage. We drove off toward Neufchateau, which was at that time the headquarters of one of the first American divisions to arrive in France. The chauffeur had been told where to take me, so I lay back behind my suitcase and half under a rug and looked out at the scenery. A very grey, bleak country, undulating and desolate. Now and again we would flash through a muddy, dilapidated village, frightening a lot of hens, causing a pig or two to stare or some man or woman to pause in his or her work to gaze at us. We had several miles of this sort of thing to do, but finally we topped a rise and began a descent on a winding road into Neufchateau. Everywhere now were signs of the American army. Rows of motor lorries on the road, groups of soldiers, men working on the telegraph and telephone lines at the side, men standing around their billets, a general busy confusion getting thicker and thicker as we approached the town. We reached the main street and reduced our speed as we wended our way through the mass of soldiers moving about in the narrow old world street. Here I was now, right amongst the Americans. First impressions? Big, strong, healthy, cheerful, with all the effective cowboy looks, strap of hat behind their heads, and the familiar large felt hat. I felt at once, I shall be all right here. Driving down the main street, we at length turned up a still narrower lane and reached a market square with the inevitable statue in the middle. Turning out of this square, we descended a hill and came at last to a hotel. Of course, the word hotel is absurd but the proprietor's feelings might possibly be hurt if I had described it as anything else. A room had been booked for me here. My bags were dragged in, and I went to this room. It was only one stage better than the hotel at Cockside, but had the advantage of not being shelled or living in fear of a shelling. You can have no idea of how much nicer a hotel is when there is no prospect of a few 5.9s coming through the roof during your stay. My bedroom was a plain uncarpeted room, no fireplace, and a plain yellow wood bed. A candle furnished the only illumination. I sat on the bed and surveyed the situation, after which I unpacked and dug myself into the room as much as possible. After repeated imprecations down the staircase, a young but portly Alsatian girl brought up some hot water and placed it in an enamel tin basin. Whilst I was having a wash and a brush up, there was a knock at the door, and on opening it I found an officer from the press censor's office, who gave me a message from the divisional general. The general had very kindly asked me to dine with him that night. I was very tired, but still, of course, I decided at once to accept this hospitality, and consequently prepared myself to go. The officer told me how to get to the headquarters, and by dinner time I reached the place. The general was most cordial and hospitable. I have seldom met a nicer man, and several times after this I had the privilege of being taken by him round the sights in his area. He, of course, had a group of staff officers around him, and they were in every way the most friendly group I have ever met. They gave me permission to do everything I liked in the divisional area. The general talked a lot about my pictures. 
He had a collection of them all, and was most interested in my war wanderings and the adventures I had met with. He was only just recovering from an attack of pneumonia, and this worried him considerably as it prevented him from being as active as he wished. Altogether a most kindly and genial headquarters. I wish all were like this one. I explained exactly what I had to do and how I liked to do it. They did everything in their power to assist. The general told one of his ADCs to go with me next day and to show me as far as possible over the various component parts of his divisional area. Late that night I left the headquarters and wended my way back to my old hotel. I mounted the creaky stairs, entered my bleak, cold room, and crept into bed. End of chapter 32 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter thirty three of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three A Primitive Hotel Yanks in Training Visit to Marine Headquarters Keenness and Efficiency. The weakest point in that outrageous hotel was, I found, the question of breakfast. I asked for breakfast, I talked about breakfast. I intimated that I was perfectly willing to pay for breakfast, but I couldn't ever get any. Whilst living there I had to be up early and off on some expedition or other in the cold mornings, and I never could start the day right owing to this defect in the management. The hotel was a French one, and was not patronized by the Americans who lived in billets and arranged for their own breakfasts. For several days I made repeated attempts to encourage the management into some effort towards a breakfast but no, it was useless. The best that happened was that I had a cup of atrocious coffee on a damp marble-topped table with a roll of unbreakable bread about two feet long. The room was a saloon bar, the time usually about 7 a.m. Opposite me sometimes sat the manager in shirt sleeves and carpet slippers, eating an enormous slab of repellent cheese and washing it down by drinking a quantity of red wine. This side alone at 7 a.m. is unnerving. Later I bought some biscuits and a tin of jam in order to deaden the taste of the coffee. My first views of the American army were made in the vicinity of Neuchâtel, in this divisional area. A great quantity of training was, of course, on at this time, and everywhere one could see strenuous work and enthusiasm. One felt and saw at once that these people had not come over from so far in any mood of a light and breezy expedition. There was business and determination in the air and, what was more, that which ultimately meant the crushing of Germany. I meant the big outlook, which you could see the American general staff was taking. They realized that the war was going to be a big job. Everywhere were signs that the work was not going to be underdone. If need be, Germany was to be swamped by the might of America. This early clear vision and its resulting big relentless effect were as instrumental as anything in starting the demoralization of the enemy, which ultimately led to his downfall. I went to a certain bayonet exercise school. Here an English sergeant was giving instructions to the American soldiers. He was a gymnastic sergeant, and a non-com in the old regulars, and I don't suppose a finer instructor could have been found anywhere. The Americans all appreciated his value and he appreciated their rising ability. It was a vigorous school, that. Bayonet charges over fields and trenches, rifle ranges, and all the arts necessary to efficient Prussian puncturing. Near this place I saw huge hospital arrangements, some finished, others being constructed. I drove with the general in his car one day to some of the outlying camps, and saw the American army at work on all phases of war training. It was a busy live sector, this Neufchateau. In the evenings when I got back I used to prowl around the men's billets and cookhouses and watch their life there. There was a French and American officers club at Neufchateau, and a great place it was too. I had dinner here several times and met many different men. Cocktails, tobacco smoke, talking and laughter, dinner, then more cocktails, tobacco, talk and laughter, a truly cheery spot. I felt that Americans way back in the homeland would have liked to know what a cheerful job their countrymen made of things. One can say with truth in this war that the nearer one was to the front, the more cheerfulness one found around. 
There were several war correspondents in this area, representing some different papers in the States, and I had the pleasure of meeting some of them. They, too, like myself, had hotels as their temporary homes. On a certain day it happened that one or two of them were going over to stay at a place about twenty-five miles away in order to live with the Marines for a bit. They asked whether I would like to come. Rather, I replied enthusiastically. So a morning was fixed for our departure. A large car stood outside one of the hotels at about seven in the morning. We all got in and started off. I have had much motoring to do during my war life, and have known what it is to be motored alongside a precipice on a four-foot road, over a yawning chasm on an amateur bridge, etc. But heaven preserve me from an American wartime chauffeur again. He reduces his speed to about eighty miles an hour whilst passing through towns and villages, but in the country, when he doesn't know the roads, that's when he goes all out. I arrived at the marine area in what you might have taken to be the winning car in a cup race. Tears were pouring out of my eyes and were frozen stiff on my cheeks. The marines are the star troops of the American army and are simply splendid. Their countrymen may well be proud of them. We went to a battalion colonel's house and found him in. I have seen a good many colonels in my time, but never a better from a military point of view than this one. He had, as a regular soldier, seen service in all parts of the world, and subsequently told me many interesting adventures of his campaigns. With him were several regimental officers who all lived in quite a nice little house in the village. The marines were billeted all around and also occupied several wooden huts. We had a most hospitable reception, and I knew at once that this area was going to be of great use to me in my job. I went about amongst the lines making rough notes and taking photographs. Here was a typical sample of the American army dumped down in this strange land to take part in a most peculiar and mighty war, and a jolly good job they meant to make of it. The housing, feeding, and general upkeep of the American soldier are excellent, and the health and strength of the Marines I saw was perfect. We all had lunch in the little house, and afterwards the colonel took myself and a couple of the war correspondents for a walk around his area. The discipline he maintained was that of a battleship. He called out a few men here and there and ordered certain things to be done to show us details of their routine. He ordered out a squad of men to do some bayonet work, and turned a strict, acid criticism on the performance. Everywhere the whole of his command worked with alacrity and smartness. Now and again he caught a malefactor, and in a few warm phrases made him think that perhaps there was a better ole elsewhere than the particular spot at that particular moment. The Marines are comparable to our guards, and one cannot say more than that. I got a wealth of material on this visit. I made drawings from life of several of the soldiers and listened to stories of Cuba and Mexico. I went into one billet, and after I had been talking for some time to those around me, one man asked me whether I had ever met Barron's father, the man who draws the pictures. This was rather embarrassing. I said I had known Barron's father for about thirty years, in fact, that I myself was Barron's father. This caused great merriment to those in the place, and bashful confusion to my questioner. I had tea up at the chateau, where the Marine Brigadier General lives and one day attended a tea-party given by the French owner of the chateau and his wife. They were very nice people, and made very light of the evil times they and their estate had fallen on. I found all my picture-stuff well known to them, as Madame had kept on buying it at Mertano's whenever she went to Paris. Finding that I am known in advance before I arrive at a place is always a great relief to me, as I hate explaining. I have been very fortunate in this respect. The first general I met up in the Italian Alps immediately produced my book Bullets and Billets and told me he had got it in Rome. Conversation amongst the Marines at this time consisted almost entirely of the theme, when are we going to be allowed to go to the trenches and begin? The keenness was terrific. No better news could have come to them than that a big battle called for their immediate attendance. Poor chaps! They got their wish before long when they performed their splendid achievement at San Mahil, and took that long enduring salient from the Bosch. End of chapter thirty three. Recording by Philip Gould.
Chapter thirty four of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty four Visits to Shelled Areas, Salvation Army Canteen, A Brewery Billet, An Omen. One cannot recount every episode which befalls in times so varied and full as these. My visits on all fronts have led to so many adventures and afterthoughts that the length of a book is barely space enough in which to fit them. But these chapters of mine are merely intended to pick out the salient features, and so I will not enumerate a lot of little incidents which happened on this front, but go ahead with an account of a visit to quite another part of the American line. Afterwards I shall tell of my last billet in the war, and how I saw in it a big omen which I correctly interpreted as foreshadowing an early termination to my war wanderings. One day I saw a chance of visiting a sector in which reposed much artillery. I took the chance and went with an officer in a car. We passed through many places of interest, towns whose names I had seen on maps and which had always pricked up my imagination. Nancy, Toul, Luneville were on the route, and I spent a few hours in each place. Luneville attracted me. It wasn't so very badly knocked about, and the town was very reminiscent of historic interest. Stanislaus, the king of Poland, used to live around here, apparently preferring it to Poland. From photographs and accounts of that country I see his wisdom. We went to Baccarat, famous as everybody knows for shove halfpenny and other gambling attractions. We also paid a short visit to Vittel, the famous watering place where I walked through miles of deserted but beautiful pump-room gardens. The artillery bunch that I went to see were right up at the front line. They were actively in the war, and this fact became painfully noticeable before I left. We entered a completely ruined village, hid the car, and proceeded to the battery colonel's house. Here we sat and talked for a good while, and then he took us round the sights. What a mess! The whole place was nothing but a pile of blackened bricks and mud. We saw the punctured tower of the old church, and went to look through a crack in a mangled-up house at the German positions. Whilst there the old, familiar gurgling whistle sounded in the air, and was followed by a cloud of dust and earth flying upwards. A shell had burst down the roads, and we knew that the Germans had started their daily annoyance. We went back into a barn where a group of American soldiers were busy staring down the road. As we looked, another shell came over and landed on the road. Out of the ensuing cloud of dust and smoke shot a motor bicycle. A dispatch rider had just missed the explosion. He motored past us totally unconcerned and went on his way. The colonel thought it inadvisable for us to move away until this riot had subsided, and I mentally conjured up a vision of what would happen if one of these shells hit our car, which it easily might. We retired to a sandbag dugout, the colonel's headquarters, and had a smoke. Whilst there the Germans endeavored to drop shells in as many unpleasant places as possible, but in about an hour the firing ceased. This was our opportunity, so we got out the car and motored to Beauvais, a little village not far away. Near here we began to feel mighty hungry, so the allurements of a roadside Salvation Army canteen held us tight. We halted at this canteen, which we found had been established in an old shell-shattered barn. A large tarpaulin formed the roof and here and there a hole in it let the bright daylight stream through down on the heads of a crowd of American doughboys who were resting from their labors. They were either eating, playing cards, or lying around smoking, and it struck me as a weird scene. The tarpaulin and the patches of sunlight striking their cowboy hats and sunburnt faces gave a beautiful effect of light and shade. At the end of this room some girls were frying eggs and making toast and coffee. It was such a human scene and I could not help admiring the courage of these Salvation Army girls living up at such a place and working as they were doing. What a terror an American soldier is for eggs. I saw a plate containing a dozen fried eggs and found on inquiry that they were all for one man. Those hens around there must have been doing overtime for many months now. I took away many pleasant recollections of that scene, the tired, strong soldiers in their muddy clothes and rough felt hats, the girls working away for their comfort such as it could be under such surroundings. We all had fried eggs and coffee and very good they were. 
Feeling much better after this scratch meal, we started on our return to the ancient dingy borough of Neufchateau. Towards the end of my visit, I again went to the officer's club. I turned to this as a welcome relief from the chilly horrors of my hotel. On this occasion, I was dining with Mr. Floyd Gibbons of the Chicago Tribune. As we left the place together late that night, he asked me where I was staying. I confessed to my hotel. He, an open-hearted companion in my misfortune, suggested my coming for a couple of nights to his place. He had, it appeared, discovered a peach in the way of billets, an old brewery at the far end of the town. Of course, no beer in it, but a few rooms looked after by the wife of the manager who was away fighting somewhere. We reached the place and Gibbons took me up to the rooms he had got hold of. Very nice, too, and a hundred percent advance on that hotel. There were two chambers, one leading out of the other, with two beds in the inner one. I had one bed, he had the other, and next morning, bacon and eggs. My first decent breakfast since arrival. Gibbons had to go off somewhere that day whilst I drew hard at sketches till the evening, when following my usual custom I went round seeing what I could. These prowls on my own in Newport, Ypres, Verdun, Udine, Neufchateau, etc., have been perhaps the least painful parts of the war for me. That night again I went to the club, and there got a message that Gibbons would not be at dinner, but that he would go straight to the brewery billets as he would be back late. Somehow or other I got enveloped in a very convivial evening. It was my last prior to my return to England, and it's a curious thing how one's last evening at a place always seems to be the best. It was very late when I emerged into the darkness and plodded off to the brewery. Feeling sure that Gibbons would probably be in bed and have left the door open, I went along whistling and reveling in the joys of my return towards England on the morrow. A good night's rest, I thought, then every hour will bring me nearer civilization and good old Angleterre. I arrived at the brewery. All was dark and still. The huge and double doors of the yard were shut. I had forgotten about these doors, but didn't regard them as an unsurmountable barrier as I felt sure there must be a small side door somewhere that was open. So I didn't worry, but looked casually for the side door. I looked, I groped, I scratched, and then the truth in all its chilly horror dawned on me. I was locked out, locked out of a brewery at midnight. I stood, silent and still, under the moonlight, coupling other words beginning with B to the brewery. What the blank? Why the blank? etc. One doesn't expect to be locked out of a brewery under the moonlight at midnight. I had a sort of feeling that something romantic ought to happen. A lattice should open somewhere above one's head, and a pale, delicate hand drop a little scented note with a seal on it, a momentary light in her window, a rustle somewhere in the shadows, and Madeline is beside you. But no, this was just a cold, dark brewery hermetically sealed. I began at last to be practical. I searched the brewery's outer defences for the least crack that would permit of my getting into the yard and thus reach the door of the house. Finding nothing that would help me, I decided to climb the wall. There was a dark, narrow passage along one side of the left-hand wall dividing the brewery from a private house. I entered this passage and kicked against some projecting woodsheds which I hadn't seen. Looking upwards, I saw the tiled top of the yard wall grim and clear against the moonlit sky. I began to climb up these wooden outhouses. I got on the roof, but slipping removed most of the skin from my left hand and allowed a leg with a military top boot on to crash through a window covered with wire netting. Then what a tornado! The sheds were filled with rabbits and hens, which till then had presumably been paralyzed by fright into silence. The top boot broke the spell. A wild scratching scamper mixed with hysterical clucking of terrified hens broke the still night air and I lay dumbfounded on the tiled roof about two yards from the top of the brewery wall. A lattice did open now, and a gnarled and twisted brown hand gesticulated wildly in emphasizing a barrage of unintelligible French, which was hurled out of the window. When the first furious blast was over, I, sitting on my tiled roof, endeavored to instill common understanding into this proud possessor of hens and rabbits. Short gaps in his speeches, when he was pausing for breath, enabled me to get quick, jerky little conversational stabs at him, and ultimately one of these got home. He at last understood that I was an officer who lived in the brewery and had got locked out. 
His grizzled head disappeared, and presently I heard the door key of his house turn, and he came outside. He wasn't at all annoyed now, but opened the side door of the brewery yard. I thanked him and entered. At last. Time about half-past one. I shall soon reach my bed, and tomorrow I have to get up early to drive off to Gondricourt, on my way back to England, I thought to myself. I stood for a few moments outside the door of the house on some stone steps, moonlight and stillness flooding the large yard of the deserted brewery. An old wagon and an empty cask or two stood in the shadows of an open shed. Here I am, I thought, in 1918, standing in a brewery in Alsace far, far away from the spot where I first started in the war. I thought of all the host of things that I had done and seen since those early days. As I thought on these things, I suddenly remembered that my very first billet in the war had been a brewery. The old deserted brewery at Nieppe, near Armentieres. What an omen, I thought. My first billet a brewery, and now a brewery again. Did it mean that this was to be my last war billet? It did. End of chapter 34 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter thirty five of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty five. En route to England. An unexpected meeting. Gibbons, with his own private key, got back into bed some time or other during that night, as I found him there on waking next morning. He was most amused at my adventure and was sorry he had forgotten to tell me about the yard shutting after a certain hour. These episodes amuse me too when they are over. This was the day I left the American front. I had seen these western soldiers training, fighting, resting. I knew the story and I felt their part, and now had come the time for me to leave. I enjoyed my visits to the American army as I have enjoyed no others. I look upon those times as the best I have spent in the war. Both officers and men are a fine crowd. I thanked Gibbons for his kindness to me, and incidentally mentioned to him the omen of the night before. He smiled. Poor fellow! I'm sure he thought the war was going to last till the fall of 1925. I left old Neufchateau in an American press car, and was whirled away to Condrecourt. En route one passes the birthplace of Jean d'Arc at Damremy. It's a weird little place and most gloomy. I don't wish to be disrespectful to the Maid of Orléans but I feel that had I been born there myself I should have been bothered with visions too. I reached Gondricourt and of course had the usual hours wait on a grey bleak platform on a grey bleak day. At last the train of preposterous length rattled into the station, and I found a seat on it somehow. And now we left Gondricourt. Farewell to the American army and all the times I had had there. We passed through Chateau Thierry, of course and I little thought that so soon would be coming that terrific German onslaught which took this place, and that, in the ensuing battles. Those chaps I had left so recently would be playing such a glorious part. The American resistance at Chateau Thierry forms an episode that will live in golden letters on the pages of American history. I returned to Paris and went to the Rue St. Anne to thank the authorities for my visit and for all the facilities they had given me. The next day I left for England via Boulogne, and had the good fortune to run into my young brother on the wharf there. He is one of those people of whom ladies say, he has got on so well, you know. He is a staff captain. You know what I mean. A red hat, two strawberry marks on the collar of his coat, highly nuggeted top boots, spurs, and shouts. He condescended to lean against a counter in the Hotel Folkestone and have a cocktail with me. We hadn't seen each other for ages, and he was going back to his corps up north somewhere. Beginning his life in the war by being nearly assassinated at Morval in the Somme battle, he, bit by bit, has risen high in his profession. He's a good lad, is my brother. England. That's where I was going now. I went, and so began the closing chapters of my war career. End of chapter 35. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter thirty six of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six Start for America. Held up. A devious course. New York. 
Liberty Loan, Speech Making, Go Sick, Start for Home. It has been a wonderful war, this, full of surprises for everyone, and I somehow think the Germans have been more surprised than anybody. But way down amongst the ordinary small mortals who form the component parts of this monstrous catastrophe, I doubt whether anyone has been cast for a more varied or unexpected role than myself. It's an ell of a time way back to 1914, as old Bill would say. And when I, fastidiously but firmly, stepped into that historical Flanders mud, I little thought that ere my part was done in this conflict I should number a visit to the United States of America amongst my other wanderings. And yet, here I am, pinning these lines on a troop ship crossing the Atlantic on my return from America. Pinning these lines, by the way, consists in searching for the paper with an oscillating fountain pen, and occasionally stabbing it down to the bed, then waiting till the next wave comes. On a troop ship in mid-Atlantic, that's where I start to write the eleventh and last voyage of Sinbad the Sailor, as it were. But it is in England where this last yarn begins. When the startling and bewildering news that I was to go to the United States was squirted at me by the powers that be, I was in London, recently returned from the American front in France. Whilst with the Americans I had frequently wished that some time or other I could go to the country they came from. To my mind one's judgment of an army is quite incomplete unless one knows what sort of a thing is behind that army, what sort of a feeling those behind have for those they have sent to war, and what those behind are doing, saying, and thinking. I little thought that this vague wish of mine would be so soon realized. Anyway, events developed. One night I received my orders, and two days later off I started. Now in these days of strife, going to America is, as everyone knows, a complicated and secretive sort of business. There is scarcely any doubt that the Germans do not like us. In fact, they have gone still further, and what's more, have been very nasty about this sailing to and from America. I shall, therefore, in accordance with what is best for all concerned, refrain from mentioning where I sailed from, the name of the ship I travelled in, and any other details which I feel might cause jubilation, information, or gratification in Cookshaven, Berlin, or elsewhere. I left London swathed in the garments which we have all grown to associate with captains in the British Army, with three boxes complete with labels. After a frantic and exhausting rush to a certain seaport in order to catch the boat which threatened to leave hourly, I then languished for a week in an hotel, as the sailing was cancelled on arrival. This, of course, was part of some cunning nautical plan, but I also learnt from sundry philosophers of the neighbourhood that there was some trouble about coal. Either there was no coal, or too much coal, or nobody to poke the fire, or something, I don't quite know what. I'm no sailor. But anyway, some bother about coal had something to do with the delay. The days of ships driven by means of twisted elastic being now quite past, we all had to wait for this coal crisis to right itself, hence that week in the hotel. I hate hotels, as I have said before. I am unmanned by a hotel. Vast palm courts and marble dining halls depress me. This hotel was one of those gigantic new structures which several revolving front doors and an array of haughty females safe behind mahogany counters who book you a room, if there is one. Time dragged along slowly in this gilded and stupendous edifice. I discovered a Turkish and swimming bath somewhere down below in a labyrinth of halls and passages, and spent most of my time down there. At last, after several false alarms, I finally got notice of the day and time I was ordered to embark. It's extraordinary in hotels how news of your departure leaks out and what a lot of interest it evokes. Strangers in field marshal's uniforms enter your room with a skeleton key and offer to remove your luggage, order you a taxi, or take your clothes away to be brushed. The whole staff of housemaids who have your room in hand, from one anemic-looking wench to about six monarchs of physical culture, all visit your room. Two lift boys take you down, and in the hall your boxes are struggled for by a platoon of swarthy foreigners in red jackets like goldfish after crumbs. 
Then finally on both sides of the rotating doors you encounter an array of giants in costumes of blue with gold braid which would put to shame the diplomatic uniform of even the smallest Balkan state. You want to set aside about five pounds for this side of hotel life. I drove off down to the docks and was not long in getting on board. What dread words those are for me, getting on board. There can never have been a worse mariner than I. If I catch sight of the funnels of a ship from the hotel windows a mile away, I feel ill. And as for the final walk up the gangway, I am from that moment onwards a strange and unearthly being. There is something about the whole construction and personality of a ship that adversely permeates my whole system. I have endured several thousand miles on various oceans, and never have I got any better. That peculiar smell which hits you as soon as you get on a ship. That compound of paint, oil, and stuffiness is worse than a gas attack to me. Well, anyway, I drove off down to the docks on this occasion and courageously went on board. It was a big ship, the larger the better for my purposes, and was about the 25,000 ton sort of thing. Two days were now spent slowly and laboriously extricating ourselves from the aftermath of the aforementioned coal crisis and the complications of the local docks. Then we pushed off. The Teuton, in his agony of thwarted hate, had certainly succeeded in making the transatlantic passage peculiar, if nothing else. The submarine was conquered, but considerable strange mannerisms were still retained. The most objectionable one, to my mind, was the fact that a voyage lasted twice as long as normally. This left me with the incessant worry as to whether we can ever reach the other side before it becomes very rough indeed. I live from hour to hour on a ship. I can strut truculently about the deck if the sea is as flat as a looking-glass, and can fight that nauseating gust which comes at you up a ventilator. But if at all rough, I am down and out in a second. I am thinking of leaving a large sum of money to establish a fund for promoting kindness to passengers among stewards. Oh, the anguish of a voyage sometimes! This voyage of which I write was, fortunately, a smooth one. This was lucky as it lasted twice as long as it usually did. After an eccentric and mysterious passage we at last knew that in a few hours we would come within sight of New York. Everything from now onward seemed to go rapidly. I stood on the front of the ship by some railings. I don't know what the part is called, but it is towards the sharp end of the boat watching for the very first vision of New York. At last, the mammoth Woolworth building reared its head, dim and pale yellow, over a confused mass of other buildings lost in morning haze. The voyage was over. In a few hours we had passed up the Hudson and were safely secured in a dock. An hour or two more and we had emerged from the suspicious and curt scrutiny of the customs officials, and were, most of us, waiting for scarce taxis, surrounded with luggage and colored porters. New York. New York in wartime, that's what I was to see. I was very familiar with the three other large capitals at war, London, Paris, and Rome, and now here was the headquarters of the newest additional nation to the determined company of Kaiser Crushers. I drove along in a taxi gorging on all the new sights. After a life spent mostly amongst two- and four-story buildings, I confess the Woolworth building strikes one more like a nightmare than anything else. It's a bit dwarfed in New York, owing to the fact that there are so many other buildings which have run to seed. An ordinary three- or four-storied house in New York would probably get run over by a tram or something. People's attention is centered much higher. In the distance, the effect of these monstrous buildings is peculiar. They are all so geometrically uninteresting, giant cubes or triangles or parallelograms. One of these habitations near my hotel was of the shape of a safety razor blade on its end, enlarged millions of times, a giant wedge as it were. My hotel was on Broadway, a mighty cube, entrance as usual by means of rotating glass doors. My rooms in the hotel luckily looked out on Broadway, and as Broadway crosses 7th Avenue just in front of the Hotel Astor, the view is more varied still. The chaotic whirlpool in front of the Hotel Astor is known as Times Square. 
Well, here I was at last, fixed up in New York in the Hotel Astor. Now, before going on further with this narrative, I must first explain a few little points which may not have occurred to the reader, and which, if they did, he might set down as egoism or swelled head or self-advertisement on my part. But in order to give a clear and concise picture of my time in America, it is necessary for me to tell you exactly how things went for me. He of the domed head and starched wide collar, Shakespeare to wit, once said, What's in a name? And now I know he was joking. A name can nearly kill you. That's my experience. The news of my going to America had preceded me. I smelt a rat when I was asked to sign a volume of fragments from France on coming down the gangway from the ship. But after a few hours at the Hotel Astor, any hope that I had ever entertained of being in America quietly was completely dispelled. The first signs of the riot which was to come took the shape of the telephone ringing incessantly. Later on, I used to spring up with a start when the telephone stopped. The silence jarred on me so. Then came the interviews. For several days I told a sequence of pleasant but perfect strangers what I thought of New York, what I thought of the war, and what I thought of the American soldiers in the field in France. Occasionally this would vary with how I came to think of old Bill and what places and battles I had been to. All these interviewers were very pleasant and clever people. On reading the torrent of articles which followed in the papers afterwards, I was amazed at what practice can do for them in the taking of interviews. One man, I remember, to whom I talked solidly for nearly three-quarters of an hour, took no notes down whatever, but he had bottled all I had said and got most of it right, too. As I sat in that room at the Astor giving word pictures of my travels and adventures, I couldn't help thinking much of those dim, distant days when first I slushed around on those bleak Flanders fields, and of my first meeting with old Bill. A big jump. The trenches at Messines to the Astor, New York. But war is full of surprises. My visit exactly coincided with the stupendous and all-absorbing movement, the raising of the Fourth Liberty Loan. I have seen war loans in various forms raised from time to time in England. I have seen our methods of doing so. I have read advertisements which pointed out in clear dictatorial terms the small-minded stupidity of anyone who failed to be enticed by four and a half percent. I have seen all our English methods at work, but for real prodigious enthusiastic effort, New York, during the loan drive, beat everything I've ever seen. Soon after I arrived I had reason to be shot around the city in a car, and, incidentally, passed down Fifth Avenue. My first impression was that the war was over. From one end to the other, on both sides of the street and festooned down the middle, hung every flag of every size and description. A vast canopy of colored cloth and kaleidoscopic profusion seemed to block out the sky, and the walls of the cube-like monstrous buildings on either side of the avenue. Here and there, through the chinks of this mammoth Joseph's coat, minor activities were rioting with each other for predominance. Here perhaps you might see a patriot standing on a platform in front of a picture depicting the entry of Honduras into the war, who, by means of dramatic gestures and unintelligible words, was holding the attention of a cosmopolitan swaying crowd, the rear ranks of which ran the risk of heavy casualties from the passing crush of taxis, lorries, decorated fire engines, and private cars. There again you might see four frantic and sexless-looking women framed in an avalanche of flags, candidly advertising the size of their mouths as they brandished liberty bond forms in the air and shouted exhortations which nobody listened to. A few yards further on you ran into a procession. No amount of inquiry could tell you what procession. You just had to use your judgment and experience picked up by travel to find out what procession it was. For instance, if you suddenly came upon a crashing band of cymbals, and over the sea of cars and people caught sight of a couple of hundred Mongolian faces wearing top hats with the stars and stripes round wound them, you might safely conclude that this was Siam, Java, or Juan Fernandez showing unmistakably that she too was in favor of raising the loan. Whilst a decorated furniture wagon or fire engine with the words, Juan Fernandez has sent more than half a platoon to the Western Front, inscribed thereon, would evoke frenzied applause and show clearly that Juan Fernandez approved of the United States and that there was no chance of rupture for years to come. 
Fifth Avenue at Lone Time is really a mighty sight. I knew that, even when peace was declared, London would be unable, or, shall I say, unwilling, to equal it. I saw these wondrous and enthusiastic sights soon after my arrival, just before all the papers had really got going with, Cartoonist Bairn's Father Says, or Bairn's Father Praises U.S. Soldiers, etc., but I was soon to be drawn into the Liberty Loan Whirlpool. Everybody had something to do with it. Everywhere all effort was directed towards the big aim in view, six billion dollars. And very soon the big clutching hand said, I see by the papers that there dwelleth in an upper chamber at the hotel called Astor, cartoonist by name Bairn's father. He must forthwith be extracted and used in our enterprise. In two days' time, letters, telephone messages, and callers arriving in massed formation left me no further doubt as to my future in New York. Out of the usual average of about twenty applications a day, I selected one or two meetings at which I would speak and determined I would do my best, such as it was, in the cause of the Liberty Loan. I would rather have a day in the trenches than make a speech. Once I get up on the platform or whatever it is, I feel better. But in that ten minutes before I go on, I tremble like a blanc mange in an east wind. All the little things which I have previously decided to say, and which I have repeated to the bedroom looking glass with enormous success, are of course completely forgotten. Instead, some lukewarm phrases are exuded through trembling lips and chattering teeth, and finally, by some miraculous piece of luck, I squirt out a lucky, pithy, and perhaps pertinent or humorous remark, which saves me from a catastrophe then sit down in a bath of perspiration. I made speeches in various parts of New York and the country round, sometimes at theaters, sometimes on a platform in a hall, once on a platform at a railway station, and once in a church. Besides these horrible activities, I held forth at innumerable dinners. The after-dinner speaking is the easiest, Brown, as you have nearly always got your hearers in a comatose state before you begin. I made one speech at a dinner where nothing but ice water was provided. I found it harder to get it over, as they say on the stage. I like an audience that has been built up on a good foundation of cocktails, table de oat, good wine, and cigars. And now, whilst all this rattle and bang was going on in New York and America generally, came the creaking and cracking of the war. The papers daily recorded signs and portents that all was not well with the Germans and their allies. Bulgaria had left the cast, then Turkey, then Austria. The excitement in America was intense. On all sides people felt that our turn had come at last. The Germans, deserted by their dupes, were at last ring-round by the ever-increasing power of the Allies. The weight of America at the right moment was turning the scales. I read the papers with great eagerness. I searched every line for any indication of the end. The end of the war. It hardly seemed possible that such a thing was near. The American public, I could see, couldn't fully grasp what a long business it had meant for us. The four years which Britain and France had endured were for them difficult to realize. Whilst in New York I got ill, a serious trouble broke out in my left ear and rapidly reduced me to a very low level of cheerfulness and vigor. Specialists told me that it was due to my being in a very low state of health and excessive nerve strain. I felt very bad indeed. An acute attack of melancholia, coupled with an incessant pain from an abscess behind the drum of my ear, obliged me to cancel any further engagements. Never in my life have I felt quite so ill as I was then. I went to the British consulate and explained the whole situation. They quite understood, and on the advice of a specialist I decided that further work out there was useless. I was really on my way across America to Australia but I knew inwardly that my number was up on this trip. I was very ill and I realized it. People that are about me when I get ill rarely take in how bad I'm feeling, as I unfortunately instinctively camouflage myself over with a film of jocularity. However, some very friendly British officers understood and did everything possible to arrange for my passage home. I went back to the hotel again and until the boat left made the best of it. I lay on my bed most of the time, occasionally pulling myself together to go downstairs for a meal. I think the accumulated strain of the past four years had at last got me, and that I now for a space had to put up with a nervous breakdown, and the sidelines that go with it. 
I caught a Cunard boat and started on the return voyage to England. For four consecutive days and nights I lay asleep in my cabin. I was completely exhausted. After that I began to sit up and take notice, as they say of babies. In two days more I pulled myself together sufficiently to draw a picture which, I am glad to say, brought a hundred pounds for the seamen's orphanage. It was auctioned at a gaff on the ship. They were a jolly crowd on that boat. It was a troop ship packed to the lid with American soldiers bound for France. A large crowded convoy steadily plodded over its zigzag course on its way to England. Meanwhile the Marconi Daily News was filling the hearts of those on board with the hopes of the successful termination of the war. End of chapter 36 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 37 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 England Armistice End the crowded transports reached the Mersey. I went on deck and lovingly gazed on the docks of Liverpool bathed in the rose-pink light of the dawn. The forest of masts and funnels, the distant tower of the Royal Liver Building, England once more. Hours, of course, must elapse now before they pull your boat round impossible-looking corners through absurdly narrow lock gates until they finally fix you up alongside a wharf with just enough distance to prevent you jumping ashore. At last the time came for disembarkation, and having said good-bye to the officers of the ship, I went on shore with all my tackle and got a taxi. I bought papers as soon as I got to the station, bought them in large quantities. Yes, I thought as I read, this war is breaking. One could feel in the air that this mighty catastrophe, which had lain like a cloud over the world for four years, was drawing to a close. By an extraordinary but painful coincidence I was back in England just when all this wonderful news was giving England wonderful peeps into what would be wonderful peace. It seemed hard to realize that the end might be near. I arrived in London and felt myself slowly recovering. There is no tonic like getting back to England, but what a tonic the world was to have in a moment. Suddenly the great news of the armistice terms echoed round the world, followed by those tense hours of waiting. I was in London, spending my days resting in bed, striving for complete recovery. Then came the great news. The Germans had signed. The war was over. My own private war was over, too, for on that night I felt that there were many strains and worries that now would be no more. The war over. I wondered what old Bill thought. I could see those muddy, battered trenches, the land soaked with all the tragedy of years, the faces of those war-worn soldiers as the news spread down the long lines which run from the North Sea to Switzerland. The war was over. Old Bill would go to Maggie. Fini. End of chapter 37. End of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. Recording by Philip Gould.